Hi. <laughs> I forgot that I don't have to hold a microphone, but I have my other things here. I'm Jill Andrews, and I'm so humbled to be here. This is absolutely the most amazing thing I think I've ever done in my life, <laughs> besides my contribution to the Ebola thing. Um, <laughs> So I bet you guys are all wondering, um, you know, what do wedding gowns and Ebola suits have in common? Any ideas? <laughs> well, they take, a, they take a, lot, a long time to put on, and they have to come off really fast, completely. <laughs> so. Uh-oh. Okay. So, I'm sorry, I have to use notes, because if I don't, then I'll just talk about fabric and things like that. But um, I think you actually want me to get to the point, so. All right, here we go. All right, so this is the Johns Hopkins, um, the CBID Lab, Center for Bioengineering Innovation and Design. It's brand new, opened this uh, two years ago. And every surface is covered with whiteboard, and you can write on everything. The tables, the glass partitions, um, there's everything that you could possibly imagine that you would need. 3D printers, these cool projectors hanging from the ceiling. Um, there's things to work with, like white Lego and these weird baby dolls. And um, it's really like the coolest place ever, and it's very slick and very modern. And then this is my studio, which is a couple of blocks away. It's in an old Victorian police station. It was built in 1899. And um, I have bolts of fabrics and dress forms. And um, when people walk in, they walk in through this room, which is the workroom. Because I want people to always remember that we make this. We're going to create this here for you. So. Um, that's a pretty big contrast between those two worlds, and it's just a couple blocks away. Um, so it was uh, fall of 2015, and I was making a gown for a friend of mine who's a Liberian journalist, and she was going to the African summit. And while she was going, when she was getting ready to go to the African summit, she was supposed to be interviewing Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and she... Ellen Johnson's relief could not come because of the Ebola crisis was elevating in Liberia. So um, that was a bit of a situation there. Sorry, I have to cheat now. <laughs> um, uh, fast forward like two weeks, and a friend of mine sent me an email. She worked for the school at Public Health, and she sent me an email. She said, oh, in your copious spare time. And um, I opened it up, and it said, uh, Ebola challenge. You can help save lives. And it said looking for um, uh, public health workers, biomedical engineers, uh, nurses, chemical, uh, chemical engineers. And it said outerwear and textile specialists. So I said, this is my in. So this is, this is I'm going. I'm going for it. So um, let's see. Sorry. Three days later, I'm working in the lab with Hopkins students and nurses and Doctors Without Borders. And um, it was just absolutely amazing. We were assessing the needs of healthcare workers to give them a better quality of life and protect them. People were, people were um, dying, obviously, from misuse of, of the, not misuse, but mistakes made while they were donning their protective garments. Um, so the schedule was, um, our schedule was set up. So it was Friday night was education. Saturday was actually brainstorming and design thinking process. And then Sunday was going to be uh, building the products and then the judging. So the beginning of our education was, started off with two nurses that actually wrote the Jipaigo step-by-step instructions for removing 
the, um, the PPEs, which is personal protective equipment. So as you can see, there are 19 steps on this one. Some have 30. And they're generally 11 pieces of the garment. So it takes a while to get in. But um, they, uh, they actually don't include the duct tape on that one, so <laughs> which is really scary. But the, um, the harder part, rather than just getting in, is getting out. So um, while we were watching the nurse in her PPE, you couldn't see her face. The Tyvek suit came to here. She had a mask on underneath, a mask over. She had goggles, she had a face shield. All you could see was steam in the goggles. And you just transport yourself into a tropical situation. And how can anybody function in that? So she was in an air-conditioned room, which was nice and cool and comfortable. And they started the process of taking her out of the garment. And it takes 15 to 20 minutes to get them out of the garment. And think about being exhausted, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, dehydrated, and every, you know, a, a claustrophobic. Like, what else can you, can, can you be in this suit? And um, it takes 15 minutes of care to get out, and somebody has to help you. So problems need to be addressed. So the first thing that they, she does is she takes her hand and brings it up to her face to remove the shield. This is after her first layer of gloves off, but she's still completely covered with, you know, imagine what her hands are in, every kind of, every kind of waist you can imagine. And um, so she removes the goggles, and you're just, you're just dumbfounded. And then she goes under her chin and unzips. And that's when I started saying, oh, no, 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 no. This has got to change. This is, this is just, there's so many things that you just start to see. And they needed a specialized suit. I was stressing out just looking at her. <laughs> so, and she was pretty quick at it because she was in the air-conditioned room. And, you know, she had, the other problem with the suits was that somebody has to assist you out. So that person has to be completely suited up, too. So who's the last person over the fence? Like, how do they get out? So see the, I mean, imagine these guys are coming to pick up your loved ones, or you're sick and they come to get you. You have no idea. You have no eye contact. You have no, you have no idea who's in there. So the face shields definitely needed to be addressed because that's terrifying. It's necessary, but terrifying. But we needed to find a more empathetic way so that people could com communicate and connect. Um, so this is day two, where we start talking about how we're gonna change the suit. Zippers instantly into the back, seams in the front up here are gone. Um, hood's gonna go away. <laughs> Uh, let's see. When we walked in that morning, there was a table that was just full of like extra Tyvek suits. It had every kind of sewing thing that you could possibly want. It had glue, Velcro, magnets, magnetic tape, duct tape, everything. It was like, um, oh, and then there was chocolate sauce, slime, and glitter. It was like a whole entire craft store just like exploded in the studio. And um, the glitter is so perfect because it's the Ebola of the craft world. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I said to work, I said to work, uh, I set up this little tiny machine, little home sew machine, slid around on the table, weighs like eight pounds, if that. And um, we started to cut the suits up and started to repurpose, just open them up and use them as fabric and started to repurpose different parts. Um, using what was already existing so that we could keep uh, cost, cost down and um, speed production. So we wanted to work within parameters that they already had.
One of the coolest things that I learned about the process was that rapid prototyping was such an amazing thing because we would, I would change a hand thing and then they'd put it on, put the glove on, try to pull it off, and as soon as it was wrong, I would just take it back, I'd recut it, change the angles of the elastic, and just give it another try. Five minutes later, I'd come back with another one. We'd try it again. So we kept doing it until we had one that we liked. We did that with every single part of the garment that we changed. Aha. So this is the, uh, this is the, um, the difference between the two suits. So we went from a 20-minute process down to about less than five minutes. Right now, um, the suit is going through various stages of testing. There's a lot of different iterations going on. But um, one of the funny things was that the suit Ubered to DC to meet the Ebola czar, Ron Klain, and it went to Fashion Week with me. <laughs> never thought I'd, never thought I'd go to Fashion Week with an Ebola suit, but, <laughs> but it was like such a cool thing that was sponsored by the IRC, and uh, that was an amazing experience. So, get to travel with it. Um, it's been all over the world right now too. It's been to Switzerland and Africa, and um, uh, let's see. So my sensibility as a designer, just working with anybody, is um, to match people's needs with what's technically feasible and viable, uh, to maximize aesthetic pleasure, and I need perfect proportion, um, and it needs to promise as performed. So uh, I worked with actors and actresses for about 15 years, and um, oh, look at there's another, there's a little label. And the original. Oh, and this original is going to the Obama Library in Chicago. He requested it. So it's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. So after working with actors and having to meet all these like crazy needs, because people would have to like do handstands and corsets and do acrobatics and you know do like the weirdest things on stage, especially in the theater where I worked. Um, Brides were easy, so <laughs> so that was like you know I got to make pretty things so <laughs> for for a long time now so um, but that's you know part of my sensibility is taking everything that I learned in the theater about the physicality that people do when they're wearing garments and um, having made costumes for ice skaters or dancers or people that wore period costumes that were really tight, we had to keep moving. We had to, um, you know, just make sure that everything was functional. Um, and I can't just think outside of the box. I have to get in the box, and I have to try it on and see if I can sit down with it on. <laughs> so um, we can learn technique, but the true gift is, like, the creativity of it all. We all go into professions for different reasons, like money, status, or securities. But some people have a vocation that turns a career into a calling, whether the calling involves perfecting your craft or saving lives or changing the world. All that matters is living up to the standard of excellence dictated by generations of innovators before us. So we must pass on and elevate cultural traditions and look forward to the future without forgetting ancient crafts and techniques and lost arts. And so that's one of the things that when I, had my, when I started my studio, I wanted to take dressmaking out of the basement again and bring it to its former glory like it was 100 years ago. So some of the coolest technical things that I see out there now are directly linking scientists with artisans. Oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> um, core principles never change. Core principles never change. And I, my theory is if you can build a bra, you can build a bridge. So, <laughs> so I love the fact that I see, I see um, origami now is being used in space. 
And um, this is an incredible ancient art that's also being used to, they have like proteins that they're folding and they're using it in biology and it makes it bind to a virus. So I'm like, yeah, go origami. <laughs> Um, and then crocheting, they use crocheting to illustrate hyperbolic geometry and illustrate structures of coral reefs. It's like, what a cool thing. Um, and then this guy, talk about an innovator. I mean, what kind of amazing revolution did he cause? And he just, he blows my mind. He's like, absolutely the most amazing person. And then there's this guy who lived in Afghanistan whose toys would fall into the uh, minefield when he was a kid. And he built this seven-foot tumbleweed out of bamboo and these rubber things that blows through the desert and can take four detonations of mines. So, I mean, it costs like $40 to make. That's, it's a toy and it saves lives practically. So, what an amazing thing. And then the mathematicians that put fractals and hair braiding and African um, architecture together. It's so amazing. So this is one of the new maker spaces in Baltimore, which I'm, I was a little bit of a part of it, but not much. But I was so excited to see all these new maker spaces opening up all over, giving people um, the access to technology. And I mean, even just from like a woodworking shop, welding, to sew labs, it's just putting creativity um, at a place where anybody can access what they need. So, this is what happens when you teach scientists to sew. <laughs> the, first time, the first time I walked into Hopkins, I was really, really nervous. And all of a sudden, I realized that, man, you know, are people going to actually worry about are they going to judge me because I'm a, I'm a wedding dress designer? Or is that going to label me? Is that going to keep me in a particular spot? I have preconceived notions about doctors, but what I learned after that experience was how amazingly open-minded doctors and scientists have to be to take risks that innovate cures and help, help uh, save lives. So, but... And then the last time, the last time I walked in, um, I find the engineer behind the sewing machine and one of the guys using a tracing wheel and tracing paper that we use in sewing and plastic ruler that I taught him how to use. And uh, the next thing you know, they make a baby Ebola suit. So, but thank you very much. <laughs>